All right, the title of uh, today's sermon is What Motivates Me to Keep Going? Uh, I just thought, um, you know, uh, we all, like, like the Bible says in Galatians 6, 9 here, like where we read, the Bible says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So what I'll be talking about this morning is motivation. You know, what motivates you to keep going? Because, you know, you've had thoughts of giving up or quitting. I mean, these are normal. If it wasn't normal, you know, you say, I have those thoughts as well. Of course I've had those thoughts. Of course I've had times where I'm discouraged, where I want to throw my hands up and just say, I'm done with this, right? And the Bible, you know, God knows this. This is why he has verses in the Bible that says, hey, let us not be weary in well-doing. Because when you're trying to do what's right, you're trying to live a life that pleases God, you're trying to go against the grain, sometimes it can be wearying, right? It, it, it wears on you. But the Bible says, hey, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. Look, if we faint not... What does that mean? If we don't give up, if we don't quit. But everybody has those thoughts. Everybody's had gone through those experiences, myself included. But what I want to talk about today is these are some of the thoughts that go through my mind when I feel like giving up. Not the negative thoughts. I'm saying what motivates me to keep going. You know, and I wanted to share this with you today because, you know, whilst you know, we can apply it to different areas of our life. Primarily, we want to apply it to serving God. You know, weary and well-doing and actually what, what motivates us to keep going and to not quit. Let's just turn this air conditioning. So a couple of things I want to share with you today. Now, the first one I want to talk about is what motivates me to keep going. So I'm reflecting here on my own thoughts, but I'm sharing with you because I'm hoping some of these things will motivate you too and make you reflect on, hey, you know, what's going to make me want to serve God with my life? So first thing I want to talk about is gratitude. Gratitude. You know, when I think about what drives me to want to serve God and, you know, do the things that I do, it's because... I reflect sometimes on the things that God does for me, what he has done for me, what he continues to do for me. And it's a sense of gratitude for God's love for me that I respond in wanting to do something for him. You know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And I think if we spend some time in our life being grateful for the things that God has given us, that may increase our love for God. You know, often we are... Uh, we tend in the flesh to think on the negative things. We tend to think on the things that are not going well. And we miss this whole, you know, gamut of things that are good, and that are well, that God does do for us that we forget about. Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you so i was always told you know these two verses one is giving thanks always for all things so these are the things you're giving thanks for and in everything give thanks so this is no matter what situation you're giving thanks so whether it's good or bad you know we should be thankful for the things that we have even when times are good or even when times are bad second timothy 3 look at here this is talking about the ungodliness in the end times this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Look at this. Unthankful. So you see how not being thankful is a sin. Unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, trady, headers, traitors, heady, High-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. So unthankfulness is a sin. 
Philippians 4 8. You know, it's good to think about the positive. The Bible tells us that we need to think about the positive things rather than just always negative things. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So let me just say this. That'll go. So, you know, the world is a fallen place. It's, uh, you know, even when, uh, you know, when I ask for prayer requests, you know, there's a lot of prayer requests that uh, tend to be negative things because, you know, we need prayer for those things. So we need to make it a point to remember positive things, the things that we're grateful for, because it's very easy to become discouraged and negative. So, like this verse is saying, we need to think about things that are true, that are honest, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, they have good report. So what are some things to be thankful for? It's good to stop sometimes and think about what God has done for us. You know, think about your life. You know, maybe things don't always go your way, but we have our life. We're alive. We woke up this morning. We opened our eyes. We had another day to serve God, to live, to enjoy the things that God has given us. What about our health? You know, our health fails as we get older. Some people have health challenges. But what about the health you can enjoy, right? Your health. Some people, you know, maybe they have health challenges in one area, but think about the health you do enjoy. You can walk, you can read, you can see, you can eat. Some of those things we take for granted. What about the fact that our bare necessities are taken care of? We have food and we have raiment. And the Bible says if we have those things, we should be content. And God ensures that we have those things. You know, we live in a somewhat free country. So yeah, it's not perfect. We all know the complaints we have about, but we have it a lot better than a lot of people in the world. I mean, I was talking to Pavel just outside. You know, he's talking about to World War I, World War II, where he was come, come from was a communist country. And people had to flee from that. So... These are things that we didn't have to go through, but growing up in Australia, you know, taking for granted the freedoms that we have had been able to enjoy. Yeah, we don't have 100% freedom, but there's a lot of freedoms that we do get. We're able to meet here. We're able to read God's word. We're able to preach God's word, free from persecution. Now, I don't know how long that's going to last, but for now, we're able to. We don't have people banging the door down, wondering why we're meeting here, what we're saying trying to keep tabs on us. So we have somewhat freedom. We have a church to go to. No, never forget that. You know, again, forget, remember the day when there wasn't a church like this where you agreed on the doctrine, soul-winning church, Bible-believing church. You know, now that it's here, maybe you take it for granted, but it's a good time to remember that this church exists. We ought to thank God that this church exists, that he's brought us together. And we have a church to go to. You know, we have our family that God has given us. We have the Word of God. You know, so many times in the past people have not had access to the Word of God. And we have it at our fingertips. And when was the last time you read it? When was the last time you took a look at it? When was the last time you studied it? Sought wisdom from it? And even if life <coughs> does not go well, for us. We have salvation. No matter what happens, we know we have a home in heaven. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God providing these things for us, dying on the cross for us. So, going back to the topic of this sermon, you know, what motivates me to keep going? One big thing is gratitude. You know, I'm grateful for the things that God has done for me. Not just the spiritual, not just the salvation, saving me from an eternity of hell, but all the things that I enjoy, that I take for granted in this life. If I stop and consider, where did they all come from? They all came from God. So this is why the Bible says in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what motivates me to keep going? Well, it's a completely reasonable service. When I think about what God does for me, how can I not serve God? You know, if I'm a rational, reasonable person thinking about what God does for me, this is why the Bible says it's your reasonable service. It's completely reasonable and expected based on what God does for us that we live for him. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So, you know, when you get the thought of throwing your hands up, giving up, or, you know, just quitting on God, quitting on doing what's right, you know, think about what God does for you. And that may spur you to do something for God. Definitely uh, helps me when I think about throwing in the towel. Number two, number two, and this is a big one as well. I mean, they're all, they're all big ones, but going through some of the things that I think about when, you know, we get weary and well-doing. Number two is my responsibility to others. My responsibility to others. And everybody has a responsibility to another person. It's not just whether or not you're in a visible position of authority or you're in a formal position of leadership. We are all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are put here by Jesus as light and salt in the world, as ambassadors responsible for the work that God has us to do because what we do matters in this world. It's going to impact other people. So when you reflect on your responsibility you have on others and others may be a closer circle of influence than others everybody has a responsibility somewhere to have a good testimony to live a life pleasing to God so we have that positive influence that God has called us to have but specifically for people that do have people that they you know are that are in subjection to them especially they're accountable to God Hebrews 13 17 obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. You see, so people that are in leadership, they are accountable to God for how they lead. And, you know, that's one thing I think about. I'm in a position of leadership. I'm in a position of responsibility. That motivates me to keep going because of the, the testimony and the example that I set, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. So when it comes to serving others, you know, your example is very important. This is why the Bible tells us to have a good example. Our example is how people see your living, what they see you're doing. And you're setting that example so that others may follow. So when you think about that, and I think about, hey, what motivates me to keep going? I think about, hey, what example do I want people to follow? That drives me to want to keep going as well because you know what I don't want to accept the example of somebody giving up of somebody backsliding of when things get hard you just quit is that the example I want to set oh I'm just getting a bit busy in my life so then I just give up on God I just stop doing the work I should be doing is that the example I want to set no I want to set an example of hey even if I'm busy even if times are hard even if life is rough I still serve God. That's the example I want to set. 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Peter 5 talks about here too. The elders which are among you, I exhort who also am an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So your example is important if you think about that. 
and what example you're setting. You know, I hope that motivates you to keep going and to not quit doing what is right. But this is why I think it's so important for your growth in your spiritual life. You know, that you have people that you are trying to teach, that you are trying to mentor, that you are trying to be an example to. See, when you're a young believer, you start off not, have, not having anybody looking up to you, not trying to influence anybody, and you have somewhat of a selfish mindset when it comes to your spiritual life. Your selfish mindset is, ah, you know, well, I don't really need church, I don't really need this, I don't really need, you know, the fellowship, I don't really, you know, need, you know, you know, the songs don't really do much for me, so I don't need, you see how it's all about what you need. It's about what you, what you it's, it's, when you're a young Christian, you only consider how spiritual things like church and fellowship and all this service impacts you. But you, you want to get to the point and you want to start thinking about how it impacts others. And this is why it's so important to be in the work of the Great Commission. You know, teaching others, baptizing believers, teaching people the Word of God. Yeah, you may not do it from the pulpit, but that doesn't mean you can't be involved in the Great Commission where you're trying to positively and teach and influence others. And you know, when you do that, you start thinking about a more service oriented works for God because you're thinking the things I do impact others. Now, this is what it was like in my life. But before I tell you, tell you that story, I want to I tell you this because this is, this is what I really reflect on when I think about how trying to do what's right, trying to influence others, trying to bring forth fruit starts to mold you. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, what do I think this means? Obviously, in analogies in the Bible, they can have multiple meanings. But I think this verse particularly speaks to the fact that we are like all brand, we are all branches in this vine. And notice here, it's not that he purges it and then the branch brings <coughs> forth fruit. The branch is bringing forth fruit and then he cleans it up so that it will bring forth more fruit. So how does that work out in your spiritual life? Well, when you start trying to serve God, you start trying to get people saved, you start trying to teach others that then starts to make you reflect on how you're living and through that work god starts to clean you up and this is why a lot of people don't always get rid of the worldliness they don't always get rid of the sin in their life because they're not first trying to serve god they think well if i get rid of the sin in my life, i get rid of the world then i'll serve god but it's the other way around when you start trying to serve god through that service it starts to clean you up. Why? Because you want to start influencing other people. You know, that's what happened in my life. When I first got saved, you know, didn't know everything, still worldly, or still like, had a girlfriend at the time. You know, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. But, I wanted, you know, I believed salvation, you know, I understood that. I wanted to see other people saved. And then when I went out talking to people about the gospel, you know, you start thinking, well, I want to impact other people. You know, maybe I should start taking the things of God more seriously, then people will take what I'm saying more seriously. So you see how that starts to purge you. You want to bring forth fruit, you start thinking about the way you're living. I wanted to get people saved. All of you know, you know, you try and explain the gospel to somebody, you come across objections. What does that make you want to do? I'm going to go find out the answer. But when you're not giving the gospel to anyone for months and months and months on end, what motivation do you have to go and learn more? In fact, you start forgetting things. You forget all the things that you learned before because now you've got no motivation to learn and grow. Why? Because you're not trying to impact anyone. You're not trying to bring forth fruit. That's why you guys, you know, you start getting into evangelism again, start getting into soul winning. Guess what? You're going to start 
learning things again because you're going to think, oh man, I want to know these answers. You know, like we go out, street evangelism. We go to Liverpool, talking to a lot more Muslims now. That's why Gersh and I are going to, going to brush up on our Quran, you know, brush up on, you know, our, our Islamic history, all this, because we want to be ready when we go and preach the gospel to them. You see how it makes a difference. You want to learn. You know, I wanted, when I was, you know, in youth group, I wanted others in church to be encouraged. So I participated faithfully. You know, I didn't want to skip a Friday night youth group because I didn't want to, you know, discourage some other, you know, kid that was there that I wanted to positively influence to say, hey, it's all right to just skip Friday night youth group. So then I could say to them, hey, you should be a youth group on Friday night. But if you say that to somebody now and then you come to church, you're not even there. I mean, what sort of example are you setting? So that's what motivates me because if I'm impacting others, if I set that example, then I can say to people, hey, this is something that, that you should do. You know, why did I start singing loud when I was in youth group? Well, it's because I saw the whole room. Everyone's like discouraged. I thought, you know what? I want to encourage people to sing loud. So then I started singing loud. You see how that motivates you to do what's right. You know, I want to think about your family. I wanted my wife to serve God so I make sure I do what I expect of her. That's why I go soul winning regularly. It's not just about whether I need to go soul winning regularly. It's about what do I want others to do? I want others to, to go soul winning regularly as well. You know, I think about how the example that I set for my children. And you know, that's when I reflected more on how important example is. Because, you know, when you are adults and you're a bit more set in your ways you're not so impressionable right you you more convince people so you know if somebody's not doing something you know you got to convince them, you got to talk to them but when your children start to grow older and they're just reflecting what they see from you from others now it really makes you think about what example am i setting and you know you parents in the room you're still young parents i think about this as well that you know your children are still, you know, a lot of them are under five, you know, under six. But as they start to get older, they start to have a mind of their own, I think that's when you'll really start to reflect on your example and what, what you're doing because you'll start to see it in your own children. But you don't need to wait until that point. If you can learn this now and consider it now, you know, you will, you know, set that example early on. And, uh, you know, you don't have to learn that lesson later than, you know, than you need to. So now I consider, you know, as a pastor of this church, I consider how it will impact people at this church. So even to a greater degree, it's so much more important that I keep going. But, you know, for you guys, what my point here is, that is a motivating factor. But because you don't have anyone or you may not have anyone that you're trying to influence it's not motivating you to keep going and to you know learn more and to grow that's what i mean all right so like this verse says start trying to bear some fruit you know don't wait until there's fruit there to, to purge your life you know jesus is going to start purging the branch when you bring forth fruit so you just have to focus on trying to bring forth more fruit trying to be an influence on other people, trying to get people saved, trying to you know, teach them, and you will start growing. So when it comes to children, you know, the Bible even sort of refers to this in, when it comes to, to women, because sometimes women, you know, they you know, may be promiscuous, but then they end up having a child, and then the child is what actually starts to make them mature. Like I'm saying, because now they have people subject to them that they're influencing, it makes them reflect on how they're living. Look at what it says here in 1 Timothy 2. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So this is not talking about salvation, like eternal salvation. What are they being saved from? Saved from the deception of the world. Saved from you know, the deception of Satan in the world. Because when they bear children, 
then they start reflecting on being a mother and being an example to this person. And you know, when we have our own children as parents, it's, it tends to mature people. So this is why it's so important that you try and bring forth spiritual children. Because when you bring forth spiritual children, then you also think about how you're impacting their lives. So, hey, it's easy to give up, but that's a selfish mindset. So, you know, service motivates you to do what's right, even when you won't do it for your own good. All right, let's move on. <coughs> so what motivates me to keep going? Gratitude to God, right? Another one is my responsibility to others. So this is why it's important that everybody have responsibility to others so that it motivates them to improve their spiritual life and keep serving God. Now number three, number three is an abundant life. Abundant life. John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, I'm not going to get all Joel Osteen on you here, you know, preaching the prosperity gospel and tell you if uh, maybe you serve God, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, wise, and have nice white teeth, straight teeth. You know, maybe I do smile like Joel Osteen all the time when I'm preaching. But we're not talking about a material abundance like the preachers of the world do, the prosperity gospel preachers. But there are a lot of things in this world that money can't buy. It reminds me of those old MasterCard ads. Remember those old, I thought that was a great marketing campaign. They have like these things in life, they say some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. <laughs> so what, what an effective ad campaign, right? And all these years, it stuck with me. But there are things in the Christian life that you can only get through walking in the Spirit. And, you know, you, you enjoy those things when you serve God, and that's what motivates that, that, that you know, what are some of those things? Let's, let's talk about those first, and then I'll make my point. Galatians 5, the Bible says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, love, joy, peace. Think about it. These are fruits of the Spirit. Now, am I saying, do I think that unbelievers or people that, you know, aren't following God the way they should, aren't trying to live a life of obedience, walk in the Spirit, can't experience these things at all? No. But... Do they experience them to the extent that God intended? And I don't think so. You know, it's, it's like the world doesn't know what God intended for a marriage because they don't do things God's way. Um, you know, they may experience love and peace and things like that, but I don't believe they can experience it to the full extent that the Creator made it for because God is the one that created these things. He knows how best to experience these things. And if the world doesn't do it God's way, it's, there's no way it's, it's going to achieve what God had willed for it to begin with. 2 Corinthians 4. So, you no know, love, joy, peace. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about an etern eternal perspective, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, can, a, can an unbeliever, somebody that doesn't believe in eternity, really experience true, worthy purpose? I mean, think about the reflections of the wisest man that ever lived, King Solomon. He said, all is vanity, vexation of spirit. Tried to find purpose in life. He said, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And that's the wisest man that ever lived. And yet, sometimes we get duped into 
hearing the social media influencers of the day talk about how they get fulfillment and how they, how they get purpose. And you just wonder whether deep down inside they know when you're gonna die one day, it's gonna all be over, and everything that gives you purpose, everything that makes you happy is all gonna be gone. But not for us. You know, what motivates you to keep going and serving God is because you can have this eternal perspective, this true purpose, living for something of eternal value. Acts 23. We talked about this last week with Paul. Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, <coughs> I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. What about living with a clear conscience? Hebrews 13, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. You know, can you really enjoy life knowing that you're falling short in an area that is the biggest and greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's a bit like when you're procrastinating. You know, when you're procrast everyone's a procrastinator, right? You've got this assignment that's due or whatever, this big project. And you, you know you should be working on that project. But no, you know, you're procrastinating, go do something else. And it, it's like, can you, can you really enjoy that other thing when you've got that thing hanging on your head? That, like, I really should be doing this other thing, but I'm not. So that's what I mean by a clear conscience. You know, when you, you know, living, trying to live right, you know, at least in good conscience. I'm not saying we're perfect, but in good conscience, you're trying to serve God. You are, you got those, th you know, those sort of boxes checked. I think you enjoy life a lot more because you don't have this burden hanging over your head. It's like, you, you, it's like when you, you, you go away on holiday. You know, and you go enjoy that holiday, you're at the beach, you're sitting on the beach, trying to enjoy yourself on a Sunday morning. Can, can you really sit there and just enjoy that moment when, when over your head you're just thinking, you know, I really should be in church. I shouldn't be here on a Sunday morning. I shouldn't be in bed, slacking off. You know, I should be in God's house. So I'm saying that, you know, one thing that motivates me to try and live for God because it's a more pleasant life. It's a more abundant life, not materialistically, but my heart is right with God and I can enjoy my life not with the burden of guilt hanging over my head that oh, I, sh I should be doing these things. What, what am I doing? I should be doing you know, these things. Living under the chastisement of God. I don't want to live a life where I'm just constantly under the chastising hand of God. You know, nobody wants a relationship like that where you're just constantly getting, you know, being told off and being, you know, being chastised. You want to live a life where, you know, you have a good relationship with God. Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Yeah, so life is better when you live for God. You know, when you can live in a clear conscience. It's like the difference between having a holiday and somebody's lazy, or having a, having a rest when you work hard. You know, when you work hard, you enjoy that rest more. You feel like, hey, I've, I've earned this rest. You know? Whereas when you're just lazy, you're lazing around, you're like resting. You're thinking, oh man, I really should be doing something. It's the same in all areas of life. You know, whether it's laziness, whether it's in pleasure, whether it's in other things, right? This is one thing I remember clearly, and I, I share with you guys, even when it comes to marriage. You know, people date, you know, they, they're intimate and things like they should, they're doing things that they shouldn't. And you never truly enjoy that intimacy. Why? Because you know it's wrong. It's guilt, and you, you have that burden of guilt. And then when you get married, and you know, it's under the blessing of God, you enjoy these things, these pleasures, in a way that it was meant to be enjoyed, that God intended. And like I'm saying, life is meant to be enjoyed by walking in the Spirit, doing those things. And I, I have experienced that in my life, I've experienced the things that God has for us. You know, and I, I like the life the way that is. 
And that's one thing that motivates me. So I want to live a life that is, is more enjoyable too, just while I live on this earth. All right, let's talk about the last one. And the last one is eternal rewards. Eternal rewards. What motivates me to keep going? Well, because I know that if I serve God, none of this time spent serving God is done in vain. God is going to reward me for the things that I do for him, whether man recognizes it or rewards me or not. Eternal rewards. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, so one thing that can motivate you to keep going is knowing, you know, not only being driven by an earthly reward. Because sometimes when you don't get the earthly reward, what, are you going to quit? You know, if you don't get the recognition that you want, are you going to quit? Are you going to stop? Or do you realize, no, I'm laying up treasures in heaven. I'm not doing this just for me. I'm not just doing this for others. I'm doing this for God. And if you think about that, that's going to make you keep going because you're laying up treasures in heaven. You're not just laying up treasures in earth. And, you know, some things of eternal value don't necessarily pay well. I mean, how much can you get paid winning souls for Jesus Christ? <laughs> they don't always pay well. But what motivates you to keep going? Because, you know, the payoff in heaven is going to be great. Right? The rewards in heaven. So with that eternal perspective, like we talked about with, you know, purpose, you know, there's nothing wrong with living for eternal rewards. I mean, would God, you know, God is a capitalist, right? He wants to reward people for the work they do. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I mean, if it was wrong to be motivated by eternal rewards, why would God be incentivizing work, spiritual work, with eternal rewards? He's incentivizing it because he's trying to incentivize your behavior. Hey, you should be laying up treasures in heaven rather than treasures in earth because I want you to live for the things of God, not for the things of this earth. 1 Corinthians 15. This talks about the resurrection. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the victory he's talking about? He's talking about like salvation. And no matter, we have this hope that one day we'll be resurrected. Because the death doesn't even have a sting over us, because one day we'll be risen again in our new bodies. So the conclusion in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the resurrection chapter, is therefore, so because of this, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, look at how many exhortations there are in the Bible. Don't be weary in well-doing. Keep abounding in the work of the Lord. Stay in the faith. Walk in the Spirit. So don't be discouraged if you have, you know, when, it, when it's not easy to, the, the spiritual grind. That's normal. It's normal that it's a spiritual grind and it's difficult to keep serving God because if it was easy, there wouldn't be all these things in the Bible saying, hey, keep going, keep going, keep going. But we need to reflect on the truths that are shared to us here to motivate us to keep going. Why? Because we know there, are, there is an eternity. We know there's a resurrection. We know that there are eternal rewards. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Look, for as much as ye know, see, you, do you know this? For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, you see what that's saying there? Do you, do you know that what you do for God is not vain. It's not prof, unprofitable. It's not worthless. It matters. God sees and he will reward accordingly. 
It's one thing that keeps me going. Because knowing, hey, it doesn't matter if people don't recognize this, or people, it doesn't matter how much it impacts, the world doesn't appreciate it. God appreciates the work that we do for him. Hebrews 11. Think about <coughs> going through tribulation, persecution. Hebrews 11.32, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. See, this is, Hebrews 11 is a great chapter, a great humbling chapter. You know, when you think you're doing great things for God, just read Hebrews 11, just puts you in your place, you know. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Look at this, that they might obtain a better resurrection. See, so what drove them to, to, to want to go through all that and do all those great things for God? It was eternal rewards. Because they knew that when they were resurrected, their resurrection is going to be better than it otherwise would have had they not abounded in the work of the Lord. Second last verse we'll go to here. 2 Peter 3.9. You know, when I talk about these topics, serving God, you know, this is my, one of my favorite verses. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burnt up. So, verse 9 talks about salvation. Verse 10 talks about the, Jesus coming again, and you know, the day of the Lord and all that end time stuff where heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus says, but my words shall not pass away. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Everything will be gone and renewed. And the conclusion here in verse 11 is knowing all these things that shall be gone, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in whole holy conversation and godliness. So, in the context of what we're talking about today, you know, what motivates me to keep going? I reflect on these things. I think about, you know, the things I've talked about this morning, being grateful to God. I think about my responsibility to others. I think about, you know, I want to live a, a joyful life filled with joy and love and peace like God intended. And, you know, that's something I want. But also, eternal rewards. I think, well, this life is only a vapour that appears for a little time and vanisheth away. And what, what is true value is the value is the treasure I lay up in heaven and all the things that we slave and sweat for and stress about in this life will one day all be dissolved. I ask myself the question, what, how should I live my life? What manner of person should I be in all holy conversation and godliness if this is the truth? But sometimes we forget about these things. And this is why it's a good reminder. Eternity really makes you consider what is worth living for. And eternity makes the value of things in this world much less. But do you have that perspective do you have that thought do you do you consider these things so that it motivates you to invest time doing things that has an eternal payoff rather than things that just have a temporary payoff so in conclusion the bible says let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Many people are driven by emotion. You probably find yourself saying that. I don't feel like doing this. You know, 
but you need to be driven by the truth. You need to be driven by what is right. Because if you're driven by emotion, you're just being driven by the flesh. But don't. Be driven by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You know, let's not give up. Let's not quit on God. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And I hope today's sermon has made you reflect on some of the things that I reflect on. And I hope some of these reasons that I have become your reasons to keep going and not quit. All right, let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, salvation. Thank you for all the things you give us. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace to not be weary in well-doing. I pray for each and every one here, Lord. We've all had our ups and downs, me included. And I pray, Lord, you know, it's not easy to, to do the right thing by you. If it was easy, then we, we wouldn't need all the exhortation in, in your word to exhort us to abound in the work of the Lord. So help us, Lord. Use us. We pray you use each and every one in this church. Use our church as a whole to do your will, to glorify you. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.